Hey guys, it's MJ and in this video, it's going to be quite interesting because we're going to be talking about credit derivatives and more importantly, the conspiracy around these instruments. So yeah, this is going to be the conspiracy of credit derivatives. Now remember, this is me studying out loud. This is very much my opinion. It's not textbook. This is not a lecture. It's me, like I said, studying out loud. So yeah. Think for yourself and feel free to disagree with me in the comment section below. But we're going to be talking about credit derivatives and maybe a little conspiracy theory that I have surrounding them. Remember, I'm taking a very skeptical approach to finance. It's going to help me um, tackle the concepts and help me learn and think about all these things that we need to know for the upcoming exams. So credit derivatives. We're going to see... They've got these weird names, and this is where the conspiracy is coming around. It's coming around their names. So they're called stuff like credit default swap, and there's also something known as total uh, return swap uh, or credit spread option, and this makes it quite difficult, okay? This makes it a difficult area of finance because these names are pretty much dumb, okay? So the names are confusing, but they're confusing for a reason, well, according to my conspiracy, at least, okay? And this is the word that I want to focus up on. Swap, option, derivative, okay? The way these things have been named is that they are derivatives or these exotic instruments um, and I think the reason for them calling them or using the, the language of derivative swap option is for them to avoid regulation not regulation totally but a very specific regulation because what these things actually are is believe it or not their insurance and insurance has a much difficult, sorry, a much different set of rules and regulations in who can provide it, who can sell it, and all these various things than um, derivatives. I think anyone can write a der derivative, or the the license to do derivative trading is much less stringent than, say, insurance. Insurance is a much more heavily regulated financial service. So what these guys are doing is they're going to call their instruments derivatives when they're actually insurance products. And the reason why they're doing that is to get around regulation and allow them to do it. But this causes a big problem because not only does it make us confused as students trying to learn, well, what is this whole thing? But it also has some dire consequences in the sense that you know, the 2007, 2008 uh, credit crunch or world recession. And it was pretty much, these instruments did play a role in, um, in the fall of the global financial markets. And they weren't properly regulated because they were passed off as derivatives and not as insurance. And the credit rating agencies, like I was telling you guys in the earlier videos, were totally fooled by the fancy mathematics that depended on really dumb assumptions like normality and because empirical evidence shows that, you know, um, financial data is more leptocurtic than normal. Leptocurtic is something like that where you have fat tails and peaked, whereas normal distribution is something more like that. Sorry, I didn't draw that very well. Anyway, so... The best way to understand credit derivatives is to realize that they are insurance. Now, I don't know how much time we've taken just to talk about this very much introduction, but it's important because what a credit derivative is, is it's going to make a payout if someone defaults. And that is absolutely crazy. So let's maybe get a different color over here. Credit derivatives make a payout on a default. So the idea is that when you have a bond, okay, when you have a bond, it has credit risk, 
as well as a whole bunch of other risks. The idea is that a credit default swap or something like that strips this risk out and creates a new package or a new instrument around it. So let me explain. Let's say I am the bank and uh, I lend money to Mr. Charlie. I lend him 100 Rand and Mr. Charlie is going to pay back 10 Rand every single day. But there's a chance that Charlie might default. If Charlie defaults, the bank doesn't get this 100 Rand and that's bad for the bank. What the bank then does is they can buy an instrument from another bank that says, well, you know what? We will sell you insurance because that's actually what this is. So pay us say five Rand premium. And if this guy over here ever defaults, we will pay you 100 Rand. So pay us five Rand and we'll pay you back the 100 Rand. The bank says, well, that's great because what we're doing is we're stripping the credit risk. And so it might be say not five Rand every single day or every time there's a payment. So now instead of getting 10 Rand, we're only getting five Rand, but at a much lower risk. And that makes a lot of sense in practice, you know, insurance around these things. Except for the fact that people can now make money if someone's defaulting. Because what happens is that another guy, let's call him Jojo, he might say, you know what, I really, I like that, that product. Let me also buy um, credit default swaps on, on Charlie, okay? So I'm also going to pay, I'll pay you five Rand, and I'll want 100 Rand if this guy defaults. So now you have two different parties, two different parties creating an instrument and trading amongst themselves on another individual who is not connected to them in any other way. And this is where that movie, The Long and the Short of It, um, I think it's called The Long Short or The Short Long uh, with Steve Carell, is you had that one asset manager guy go to a bank and say, I want to take out this position. I want to be the Jojo here. I will pay you guys a premium. And if there is a default on the mortgages, I want a payment. A benefit and this is why his investors got really upset with him because they said you're you're hemorrhaging money you're paying these premiums every single month to the bank for a a product which you have no exposure to are you dumb and in a way he was taking a speculative uh, position because one of the things of insurance and this is where they've gone around the insurance law is one of the, the criteria for insurance is that the person buying the insurance must have a, an interest in that what's being insured uh, so as to avoid moral hazard, to reduce the risk, and so forth, so forth like that. So in a sense, this person here, the bank who's making that loan to Charlie, doesn't want Charlie to default. And that's why you can get the, the insurance. It's like almost like buying insurance on your own car. You don't want to crash your car because it's your car. But buying insurance on somebody else's car, then you might go and say, hey, bro, you know, drink before you drive so that they have an accident because you're going to get a payout if they have an accident. It's, it's kind of crazy. So it's breaking one of the rules of insurance. Uh, also, insurance has got more regulations and all those type of things. But they're getting around it by calling it, giving it this weird name. And I was always thinking, what, why are they calling it a swap? And if you think about it, insurance is a swap, even with, say, car insurance, okay? What we're doing is we're swapping premium for benefit, okay? So they're get on, getting away with the semantics of these terms, and they have, you know, sidestepped the regulations, which is dangerous because it has these catastrophic um, effects. But anyway, coming back to credit default swaps, one thing I saw in the movie which I really enjoyed was... This guy comes and he tells the bank, he says he wants them to create this contract. So this was not something that he could buy um, over the, I mean, buy on the, the exchange because it didn't exist at that time. He said to them, he said, 
this is the product that I want. It was very much tailor-made, customized, over the counter. And he went to all the banks and he kind of did this, took as much as he could. The banks, they thought, man, this guy's being an idiot because we have done our copulas and we've done our own little risk models, um, which shows that the credit risk is very small. Okay, so they thought that the credit risk was very small. Problem is, this model here was flawed on the assumptions. You know, it assumed normality. Remember, I was talking about that. We don't want to get too technical. But basically, they made uh, a model that had a various mathematical assumptions which were flawed. This guy realized that and thought, you know what, I'm going to take advantage of this. The interesting part of the, the movie was, is how long it took for the, the entire financial market to crumble. It took years and years, or also, sorry, months and months, and this guy was paying this premium. And that's why you see in the movie, you know, his uh, performance keeps going down, you know, minus 10%, minus 20%, minus 30%, until there's finally the payoff, and it's plus 500%. So if you ever got confused by the video, um, this does explain it a little bit. But this is my conspiracy around credit derivatives, is that they're not derivatives. They're not swaps. They're not options. They are actually, in fact, insurance. And therefore, that you should be uh, pricing them and thinking about them like insurance. You should, they should have the same regulation as insurance. And maybe if that was the case we would not have had um, the credit crunch. Look, the credit crunch was, no, 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 maybe I lied. The credit crunch was for other reasons, I mean, like the securitization and all these other things. What the, the credit derivatives did is they added on more risk. So let me sum off this video quickly here. Let me explain how these things amplified the problem. So the bank sells houses, okay, and they have this, credit risk exposure, okay? And this is where it gets really crazy. So a bank has credit risk exposure in the sense that if the person who owns the house, okay, defaults, then the bank loses money or has to collateralize the house and resell the house and there's all that administrative burden. But what these banks would then do is they would then sell a credit uh, derivative on their own asset. So let's say their credit risk was 10%. Instead of buying a credit uh, derivative or taking the position to hedge that out, they speculated on it with this other guy. And what they did is they amped it up to say 20%. I'm just making these numbers up. But so instead of credit risk being say 10% that the person defaults, sorry, they didn't increase the percentage, they increased their exposure. So let's say there's a 10% that the guy defaults on repaying his home loan. Then that causes, say, 100,000 Rand loss to the bank after they've done collateral and sold off the house and all that sort of stuff. So that is their risk. Their credit risk is 100,000 Rand. By then selling these uh, credit derivatives, they then increased their exposure so that if a risk did happen, it was actually 200,000 Rand. I'm also, again, just making up these numbers. Uh, for illustrative purposes. Now, what we're also going to be talking about later on the course is this whole agent and principal um, problems that or dilemmas that happen in business. But the people in the bank, they were excited to sell these instruments because they would earn a commission on it. So they were happy to increase the bank's risk exposure in order to get their commission. Because if the bank tanked, they didn't mind, they just wanted to get their commission. And so this was a massive breakdown in risk management <laughs> and it's it's actually it's it was it was basically a beautiful disaster how how oh, they built this house of cards and then they blew they basically got a fan and they set up a fan right next to it and they pumped it up to its maximum level and they basically wiped themselves out um, it was a massive systemic uh, risk and i mean it was so clear that that's why these guys were going to the banks and buying these instruments but that is my conspiracy. Um, remember, I basically haven't really spoken a lot about the notes go a lot into the, the formulas used and how to price these things. But I just find this fascinating how I was always confused at Varsity. You know, why are these things called swaps? And when you start learning about regulation, and you start picking it all together. 
it, it does actually make for quite a nice conspiracy um, around this. But yeah, these are credit derivatives, but like I said, I don't think they're derivatives. They are more likely insurance. They're insurance in the sense that you're getting a payout on the default. And so you should be buying the insurance um, if you have that exposure, not selling it. Because this is basically what it was. Maybe let me explain it one last time uh, so that you guys actually get how crazy this is. It's like having a car and instead of buying insurance, so if your car crashes, instead of buying insurance on your car, you sell insurance on your own car. So if you crash, you pay the 100,000 Rand to rebuild your car, and you pay another 100,000 Rand to some random person who you then took the risk out on. So you're doubling your exposure. And the reason why you're doing this, well, if you're a very good driver, you might want to do this in the sense that the person is paying you a premium every day, uh, say 20 Rand or 200 Rand a month or whatever it is. And maybe this could be quite a fun model or a product to make in the, the world is maybe call it car derivative, where you, <laughs> you basically sell a derivative or you're selling insurance on your own car. So if you crash, not only do you have to pay out your car, but you actually have to pay out even more to another party. I think people will drive very, very carefully on the road then, so it might actually have some good uh, knock-on effects. But this, this just shows you how crazy and how messed up the financial world was getting um, pre-2007. And it's no wonder why we actually had this credit crunch. But anyway, this has been quite a fun video. Um, tomorrow will be more serious. We'll be looking at asset liability modeling and how actuaries have actually created this practical technique that has assisted investors in setting their objectives and reaching their goals. But... Well, this time, I'm going to leave you guys with this conspiracy. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Hit subscribe because, like I said, a video is coming out every single day. Cheers.